sing Christ is all I need. Amen. Amen. We'll sing both verses of number 22. prayer very quickly. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special day, this Roundup Sunday that you've given us, and Lord, you know all the needs that exist in this congregation right now. You know those who have health needs uh, that need a touching, healing hand from you, and we certainly pray for that. Uh, you know those who have heart needs, those who uh, possibly have a broken heart today or a needy heart today, and I pray, Lord, that you would help them as well. I pray that you would do your drawing work in our midst and that you would make a great difference in our lives. And we will give you the praise for what you are about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. And okay, we're doing things a little bit different. The prayer man has the day off right now because the preaching man has the day on. And so he told me he's summarizing his message. It'll only be three hours. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and, uh, and, uh, th and three hours in, and I've always told you that I'm a type A personality. I've mellowed to a type A minus. You will be sure after you meet this man that I am a type C. You will, you will, you will demote me. This is really, really true. Uh, to our teens, good to have you here combined in our class today. Glad that the carnival did not destroy your entire physical condition. And, uh, and I know some of you, some of you risked carnival food and uh and uh, but you're okay and i'm glad to have you here uh let me say hello uh to to right here got andrew and barb they are corvallisites uh, that doesn't even sound good sounds like a parasite uh but anyway they're from the corvallis area but they attend harvest baptist church in albany oregon and well look they made the they made the whole trip here i think just to see you brother they never make the trip to see me and, uh, but I am so glad that you're here today and you're able to enjoy the service with us. And so we're not going to give any more time. Brother Larry Brown, this is his beautiful wife, Mrs. Rhonda Brown. And anyway, he is preaching the word. You could kind of maybe tell a little bit about the ministry that you have now as well, brother. Go right ahead. Thank you, thank you. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter number four, please. Psalms chapter number four. And we're going to be right into the message quicker than a wink. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, uh, Fifty years ago this year, I organized a church in the little corn town of Washington, Iowa, and pastored there 38 years. And uh, organized church with four men and their wives, and uh, pastored it uh, 38 years, and then resigned and went into evangelism. And when I resigned, they called my 27-year-old son to be the pastor. And that's been 11 years ago, and he's still pastoring. So shortly after I resigned, I was uh, my wife had passed away uh, about a year before that and uh, died with cancer and uh, here I was in my 60s and so I was holding a meeting in Austin Texas and met Rhonda and the rest is history now that's the short version uh, you ladies would much appreciate the longer version but it would bore you men to tears so I'm not going to get into it I just want to say we're glad to be here Rhonda and I we go everywhere we show up more places than Elvis we really do and uh, you know Elvis quit showing up I, you used to see his picture you buy your loaf of bread and it 
have his picture on the front of one of these tableaux and says Elvis spotted somewhere. Well, I've quit seeing him. I don't know. He may be dead. I don't know what, what could have happened to him. But anyway, we show up more places than Elvis. We go around the country comforting the discomforted and discomforted the comforted. And uh, that's what we do. I'm sure glad to see you. It's good to be here. Rhonda and I, we... Uh, we're not, we're not nearly deads, we're newlyweds. I want you to know that. And that's the way we live. We're not near as bad as one couple got ready to retire in the evening. And they'd had a long day. They'd been married almost 60 years, still living alone and doing well. But they were, had worked all day and they were tired. And they went in the bedroom to retire. And the man went over and sat down in the chair, trying to muster enough courage to get up and get his shower and get in the bed. The lady went over and stood by the dresser and she reached up and took her glasses off and placed them in, uh, opened the dresser drawer, placed her glasses in the drawer. She reached up and took her little necklace off and placed it in the drawer. Uh, she reached up and took her um, left hearing aid off and placed it in the drawer. And then she reached up and took her right hearing aid off and placed it in the drawer. And then she reached up and took her upper dentures out and placed them in the drawer. Then she reached up and took her lower dentures out and placed them in the drawer. Then she reached up and took her wig off and placed it in the drawer. Then she reached down and unscrewed her left leg and placed it neatly in the drawer. And because she only had one leg to stand though, she just fell like a crashing tree right over in the bed. Well, when she did, she looked back at her husband who still sitting there in the chair uh, just looking at her like this she said would you mind telling me why you're sitting there staring at me that way he said oh I'll tell you I'm sitting here staring at you this way because I'm just trying to figure out whether I'm supposed to get in the bed or get in the drawer I don't know which which part is mine and uh, so, but we've got it all. We haven't come to that stage of matters yet. I'm open to Psalms chapter number four. Uh, here is a Sunday school lesson. I believe in preaching and I believe in teaching. And, and I'm basically a preacher, but when I come to Sunday school, I think you ought to learn something and get something that you take home with you that you did not have when you came. And so here it is. And uh, I've got about 35 minutes here. If I stay on schedule, the preacher said I could take till 10 till. Um, and we'll see how that works. But I'm open now to Psalms chapter 4 and verse number 4. And I hate to discomfort you again, but I'm going to have you stand up and we'll read a verse. And we won't read but just a verse and we'll get right into the message. Psalms chapter number 4 and verse 4. Stand in all and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Selah means whoa. Put on the brakes. Stop right here and think about what's just been said. Now, what's the centerpiece of what's been said here in this verse? Commune with your own heart. Look at me now. Commune means talk. When you commune with somebody, you're talking with somebody. But who are you talking to in this verse? Commune with your own heart. Literally. What he's saying is, talk to yourself. This is a lost doctrine. It's all over the Bible. Uh, for instance, the Bible says in Psalm 77, 6, I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. How about Nehemiah 5, chapter 5, verse 6? I consulted with myself. How about Ecclesiastes 1, 16? It is said of Solomon, I commune with my own heart. How about 1 Chronicles 21 in verse number 12. Now therefore advise thyself. Give some advice to yourself. Literally, what he's, and many other places, I'm going to show you some more here in just a moment. But all over the Bible, the Bible teaches us and even commands us to just literally drag up a chair, set it down, and just have a little talk with ourselves. We love the song, Just a Little Talk with Jesus Makes It Right, and every day of your life you ought to talk to Jesus, and there's other people you ought to talk to every day of your life. If you're married, you ought to talk to your spouse every day of your life. Uh, if, you, if you have children, you ought to talk to your children every day of your life. If you have parents, you ought to talk to your parents every day of your life. And there's many others you ought to talk to, but you ought to, number one, you ought to talk to God every day of your life, and number two, every day of your life you ought to talk to yourself. 
Talk to yourself. And that's what I'm teaching about. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless us and may we learn something that we can take home with us in this Sunday school hour. Give us now thy truth, thy wonderful truth that transforms lives and transforms other people's lives. Bless us now as we do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. And as quick as you can, turn to Luke chapter 16. Uh, I'm going to read that here in just a moment. Talk to yourself. Now, when are you going to talk to yourself? Well, uh, in the hour of decision, in the hour of decision, you need to drag up a chair. I'll get this over here so the people on the right can see me. In the hour of decision, you need to drag up a chair and talk to yourself. Let me show you here in the Bible. Look at it now. In Luke 16, verse 1, and he said also to his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. He was called on the carpet. <laughs> called on the carpet. I hear you, you've been goofing off. I hear you've not done your job. Now I want you to give an account. It's, it's accountability time here. And you may not even have a job and don't know it. You may be fired already and don't know it. But look what happened in verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from thee the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I'm ashamed. Who is this man talking to here? Talking to himself. He's having a conversation with himself in the hour of decision. And then immediately when he says to himself, What shall I do? He answers the question in verse 4. I'm resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Now look up at me. He says, what are you going to do? The boss man's called you in, and he's called you on the carpet, and you have not been doing your job right, and he's getting ready to give you your walking papers. I know, but I don't know what to do. I can't. But I, to, be, to dig, beg, I'm ashamed. I don't want to become a pauper. And, and uh, to dig, I, I don't know how to dig. I I'm not a manual labor person. I've always been a, I've always been a, 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 in management, and I don't know what to do. Well, you better figure out something, and it won't take long for him to fire your head. You better get, but I don't know what to, what have I got? Oh, wait a minute, I got an idea. I'm resolved what to do. I just go out and tell uh, my boss man, uh, uh, debtors, everybody owns, uh, owes him anything, I'll just tell him, uh, you just sit down and write half check for half of what you owe him, and you can walk out scot-free. You don't ever have to pay the rest of it. Now, let me ask you a question. If you hired a man to take care of your assets, and he told all your creditors they could get out scot-free and just pay half of it, would you keep him, or would you fire him? I'd fire him. I'd fire him. I'd send him down the road. But the Bible says the Lord commended the unjust steward. And here's the reason he said so. For the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. What's he talking about? The children of this world don't talk to God because they don't know God for the most part. But they do talk to themselves. But Christian people don't do that. And if they do it, they don't do it enough. Talk to yourself in the hour of decision. Hey, we got some young people here. Let me tell you this. When I organize the Marion Avenue Baptist, yes, ma'am. Well, I do, but I don't think it works. Uh, yeah, he's just for recording. He said, when I get away from the pulpit, uh, it's just for recording. So I don't think there's any speakers in the room at all, is there? Okay, yeah, if we could turn it on. Uh, can you hear anything now? Okay. Well, if we could work on that, maybe. I, I can be heard now, but in, in the preaching service, if we get the speakers turned on, that would be a wonderful thing. But anyway, I, I want you to notice here, in the hour of decision, this young person um, was 14 years old. And when we started the church, now we're talking 50 years ago, um, the parents of this girl went with my wife and I to Hammond, Indiana for a pastor school. Now, this was 50 years ago. And... Um, they were so impressed, they felt like the Queen of Sheba when she had seen the glories of Solomon. And so they came back and announced to Joyce, we're going to jerk you out of your school, and we've already contacted members of First Baptist Church. We're going to board you away up there and pay those members for you to live in their home, and we're going to put you in Hammond Baptist High School. 
And I remember Joyce saying, I mean, she panicked. Any 14-year-old girl would panic. What am I going to do? I'm a farm girl. I wasn't made for that big city and the fog and the smog and the dirt and the filth and the liquor joints and all. I wasn't made, listen, I wake up every morning to the hog feeders flapping. I wake up every morning to the turkeys gobbling uh, on the farm. Uh, what am I going to do? <coughs> and besides, I've got my friends. I've got my friends, and, and, and I can't leave my friends. What am I going to do? Well, her parents did not back down. Now, quite frankly, if I were them, I wouldn't have done that. I think that a girl needs her mama and daddy. When she's 14 years old, I think she needs her mama and daddy about as bad as she needs anybody else on planet Earth. That's my personal opinion. However, however, these were good parents. They loved the Lord. They felt they were doing the right thing, and they would not back down. And Joyce tried to talk to them, didn't work. They would not back down. This is what we feel God wants us to do in your behalf, and we want you to go to him. And I'll never forget hearing Joyce say this. She said, I said to myself, now she's talking to herself. She said, I said to myself, Joyce, what are you going to do? And Joyce said, I don't know. I can't leave. This. I, can't, I don't know that place. I don't know anybody up there. And, and that big city, I'm a small farm girl, little uh, Kelowna, the town she lived in, is probably 1,200. Uh, and, and, uh, and I can't, what am I going And then I heard her say this. She said, I said to myself, I do not know what I'm going to do, but I do know what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to walk over my mom and daddy. I'm not going to run away from home. I'm not going to become a little rebel devil. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And they didn't back down, and she went and graduated up there and went to Hiles Anderson College and graduated again and met a wonderful young man from Georgia, and I married him in our church and then called him to be my assistant pastor for 10 glorious years. And Joyce is the happy mother of six children, uh, all of them, most all of them married now, some of them on the mission field and others in full-time ministry. And she goes around teaching ladies everywhere and, and being a blessing to women. And it's just because she had a talk with herself, I don't know what I'm going to do. I just know what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to run over my mom and dad. Have a talk with yourself in the afternoon. Look, there's a preacher, pastor. You would know the man if I called his name. Years ago, he called me. He was a pastor in church, I think running 150 at that time. And he got a call from a church down south. And he was a son. And he got a call from a church down south. And this church had run about 500. And it was from his state, his home state. And he thought, look, I don't talk like these Yankees. I don't eat like these Yankees. I, I, I mean, they're a, they're a different bunch up here. I feel like I'm in a foreign country anyway. And I haven't got this call to go back. And, and so I talked to him. And after I talked to him, he talked to himself. And he sat down, and here's what he did. He took a piece of paper, and he wrote on one side all the reasons why he ought to go south and take that church. Now, he's talking to himself. My mom and dad are old. They're going to get older, and I'll be there to help them. I am a hunter and a fisherman, and that's a hunting and fishing paradise down there. Um, I am a southerner. I talk like a southerner, eat like a southerner, think like a southerner. I don't, uh, this is foreign country to me up here. And, and he, he wrote out all these wonderful reasons why he ought to go south. Then on the other side of the paper, he wrote down, he began to make a list of all the wonderful reasons he should stay. Reason number one, God put me here. He looked at that for a moment, tore the paper up, threw it in the trash can and stayed. That's probably been 30 years ago now. And the guy built a church to 800 because he had a talk with himself. Uh, and I, I, I never put this in in this little message, but I had to have a talk with myself when I met Rhonda. I had four qualifications for a wife. Number one, she had to be a deep south southerner. Rhonda was not a southerner. She was a Midwesterner that had moved to Texas. Number two, she had to be somebody I'd known all my life. You don't know anybody until you marry them, and then it's too late. You know that. And uh, I, had never, I had never met Rhonda. Strike two. Number three, I wanted an introvert. I wanted somebody to sit on the back pew and not speak unless spoken to. If you got in here before Sunday school talk, you saw that she was like a bird dog. She's all over the church. Did you notice that? I mean, she's, she's going around talking to everybody. And, and you came in here and you thought, 
has she been appointed the new lady usher of the church or what is her deal, you know? She's just all over the church. Rhonda is not an introvert. Number four, I was 65. My wife, I'm getting ahead of myself. My first wife died with cancer. Rhonda's first husband died with a heart attack eight years before I met Rhonda, holding a revival in a motel room out west. She got the call. He was gone. Uh, but number four, I was 65 years old. I wanted a 50-year-old. Now, my good friend Tom Williams, evangelist Tom Williams, at age 70 married a 40-year-old. And I said, uh-uh, I'm not going down that road. For two reasons. Number one, I don't want to raise too many eyebrows around the country as I preach. And number two, I don't want to take a chance on starting another family not at my age. I'm done. But now I thought a 50-year-old, that would put me pretty safe. Rhonda was not 50. She was 62. I didn't tell her all this until about three months after we got married. And she listened, she listened very sweetly, and she said, well, I guess I blew your life big time then, then. But we have laughed about it so often. I had to have a talk with myself. I had to have a talk with myself. You have a talk with yourself in the hour of decision. And when you talk to yourself, be honest with yourself. Luke 6, uh, 12, 16, the Bible says, the gra- no, look, don't look it up, I'll be gone before you get there. And Luke 16, uh, the rich man, uh, grounds brought forth plentifully, and he said, what shall I do? I don't have room to bestow all these goods that God has given me. What shall I do? I'll tear down my little barns and build great barns. He talked to himself, but he lied to himself. If you've got more than you can handle, what's the common sense thing to do? Give it to somebody that don't have more than they can handle. Give it to God's house. Give it to God's work. He lied to himself sometimes. The Bible says counsel in the heart of man is like deep waters, but a man of understanding will draw it out. you got some smarts inside that you've accumulated over the years. God has helped you get it there. And you got some smarts inside, but you don't stop to talk to yourself and reason with yourself about what you already know. Talk to yourself in the hour of decision. Number two, talk to yourself in the hour of testing. In first, just jot these references down if you would like to. That's up to you. But uh, I'd rather you listen to me than be writing. First Samuel 30 and verse number 6, the Bible says that David had made some dumb decisions that cost his closest friends, their wives and families, and... The Bible says, David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. And they were his closest friends. But if you make a decision that costs your close friends, their wives and children and families, your closest friends are going to want to stone you too. I mean, you know. And the people spake of stoning him. And David was greatly distressed. But then here's what it says in the same verse. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What did he say to himself? I don't know. Bible don't tell. And I don't know what you say to yourself when you get discouraged, depressed, downcast. I know some things I can say to myself, and I'm responsible to God to say them because I need to get up. I need to get up. I need to get up out of the doldrums, out of the because the devil's a dirty fighter. He'll kill you. He'll he'll finish you off if you stay down there long enough. And so. Talk to yourself in the hour of testing. My my first wife and I, we were married 39 years. We had seven children, and um, uh, she got cancer. Well, several years before she got cancer, of course. We had our first child. He lived perfect. We'd waited seven, we'd waited three and a half years for a baby, wanting children all that time. And lo and behold, uh, perfect nine months lady, and the child lived three days and died. And my wife had almost died. 21 days before she could come to the table to eat, ladies. We had a doctor that didn't know anything. Finally got kicked out of our local hospital for malpractice. And he about let her die. But, um, but anyway, uh, I walked in her room. She said, is the baby dead? I said, yes, the baby's dead. Weeping, she took my hand, looked up in my eyes, and says, promise me we will never have another baby. And God gave me some wisdom right then. I said, honey, I cannot promise you that, but I will promise you we will never have another one until you're ready to have one. I just felt led to say that. And you may not would have let, felt led to say that, but I felt led to say that. We'll never have another one until you get ready. That woman went on, had seven more wonderful children, all of which are in somebody's Baptist church and on mission fields this morning. But she had to have a talk with herself in the hour of testing. She died with cancer. And as she was down for the count, she died at home. And and as she was dying with cancer, 
She looked up at me. She could hardly talk. She was laying on the couch there in our living room. She said, Larry, how are the children doing? I said, well, pretty good except one. She said, what's wrong? And I told her who it was, a girl, one of our five daughters. We had five girls and two boys. Uh, she, she said, what's wrong with her? I said, well, she's bothering me. She's saying things like, Dad, you don't have to worry. My mother is not going to die. God would not allow my mother to die. The way she's loved God and won souls and directed children's choirs and stood with you and this family and what she means, old soul winning and everything. Uh, God would not allow my mother to die. And Daddy, I prayed about it. God showed me clearly, Mom is not going to die. And I said, she's worrying me, Diane. She's worrying me. She was so weak. She looked at me. She said, send her to me. I said, okay. She came in by her mother's bedside, and her mother looked up at her. All she could do was just to raise her hand and say, girl, I want to tell you something. When I was 16 years old, my 39-year-old mother died instantly. Deep varicose face, uh, vein slit, went, uh, a blood clot slipped right up her leg, straight, straight to her lungs. She went into a coma. And she was dead in the ambulance before they could get out of the side of the house. Diane was riding in the back of the ambulance when it happened. She died. She said it was the darkest hour of my life. I didn't have a close friend. I didn't have a sister. I had two little brothers. And suddenly I was thrown into the role of mother and wife and everything else just to tend to those two little boys. She said I was 16. She was popular in school, but she didn't have any close friends. Some people are that way. She said, I thought life would end there. I thought life was over for me. I was close to my mother. She had a good daddy, but she wasn't near as close to him. And she said, I thought it was the end of life. But she said, you know, it was not the end of life. The best years of my life was still ahead. You seven children, this great ministry, your dad, all that we've done and all God's let me see, the best years of my life were still ahead for me. And I want to tell you something, girl. If I can give up my 39-year-old mother when I'm 16 years old, you can give up your 58-year-old mother when you're 21 years old. Now, straighten up. You say, how'd she do? Well, she straightened up. She's now married to Dr. Jack Treber's son, and they started a church in uh, Surprise, Arizona, near Phoenix. And she's a happy mother of, how many she got? Not, honey, I got we, five, five children. We got 41 grandchildren sometime. Uh, they're still coming. I got another one due here in about, just about two weeks. A and they're still coming. But hey, she's a happy mother of five children and, and loves the Lord and doing well because her mother talked her into having a talk. You're going to have to have a talk with yourself in the hour of testing. You're going to have to have a talk with yourself. And uh, I could go on and on. And talk. Look, drag up a chair. And say things to yourself like this. You're not the only person that ever buried somebody that you love. You're not the only person whose husband ever walked out of your life as though you didn't exist. You're not the only person that was ever told you had cancer. I had cancer 20 years ago. Everybody, including me, thought I was going to die. God had different ideas. That's been 20 years, so I didn't die. Colon cancer. Had the surgery. Everything. You're not the only person who ever had a close friend turn their back on you or criticize you. You're not the only person that ever got a crippling disease. You're not the only person that ever faced a heartbreak that would rip you apart. So straighten up. You ought to have a talk to yourself when you, when you go through the hour of testing. Here's another one. Have a talk to yourself. I love this one. When you, ha when you go through the hours of life's natural crises, Psalms Chapter 90. Just write that down. Psalms chapter 90. I'm gonna, I'll tell you about it. In Psalms chapter 90, we have a very familiar verse that probably you don't understand. Here's the way it goes. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Now watch this. Look at What does that mean? So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What does it mean? This is Sunday school. We're trying to learn something. What does it mean? Well, First of all, what does it not mean? How are you going to number your days? Would you tell me how I know I cannot number, uh, add up all my days so I'll know how to live them wisely? Tell me how I, why I can't do that. Don't know how many days I'm going to live. You're right, son. You're listening over there. I like that. Uh, look here. You don't, don't, you don't know how, how many days. 
They wouldn't let y'all sit down? They wouldn't give y'all a seat? Okay, all right. Yeah. I don't care whether they sit down or not. They, they're standing still and listening. That's better than some that stay in the pew and wiggle. Amen? All right, but hey, listen. So teach us to number our days. I don't know how to number my days. And, but the context of the scriptures, there's a couple of verses before that. For all our days are passed away in wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The context of Scripture tells us what it means to number your days. We spend our years as a tale that is told. A tale that is told is like a book with chapters in it. Your life has chapters in it. And these cycles or stages of life are like a tale that is told. Well, on um, uh, April the 29th, uh, 1946, he was born in the Annie P. Memorial Hospital in Reesville, North Carolina. Uh, son of James W. and Ruby Hale Brown. And uh, so that's where my story starts. But I've had a lot of chapters in my life. And that's what it means by numbering your days. Teach us about the chapters of life. Look, there's a lot of stages in life. Let me give you three that are found. There's a bunch of them in the Bible. 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, uh, uh, the lust of the eyes, uh, <laughs> the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Did you ever stop and think, it says, that's all that's in the world. You cannot commit a sin that doesn't come under one of those three categories. It's impossible. The lust of the flesh, the desire to enjoy something. The lust of the eyes, the desire to get something. The pride of life, the desire to be something. There's no sin that doesn't, that's all that is in the world. Do you ever stop and think of the depth of that verse? But watch this. They fit perfectly three chapters in life. The lust of the flesh, the desire to enjoy something, basically refers to the youth. You can have lust of the flesh in any era of life, but it's particularly confined to youth. I mean, every commercial you see that sells anything to enjoy for the flesh, whether it's a Pepsi or a Budweiser, or Pendleton whiskey, or whatever. Anything that is advertised, you'll see young people advertising it. They don't let grandma sell Pepsis. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they won't. Eat. You'll never see grandma in a Pepsi advertisement. Polydent, maybe, but not Pepsi. Okay. And so, what are we saying here? Lust of the flesh is youth. So if you're you young people, we got some young teenagers and young people here, you need, you're in that category, you need to stop and say, now wait a minute, what is my biggest battle going to be? Flesh. That's going to be my biggest battle. So I have got to, I've got to realize what stage I'm in. I'm teaching you how to number your days, the lust of the flesh. But then you get to middle age, the lust of the eyes of the desire to get something. Hey, wait a minute. We've got to get this house paid for. And it wouldn't hurt if we bought that little piece of property because we're going to get old. And when we do, we, we, our little Social Security check's not going to cut it. So we, we've got to have this. We've got to pile up here. And if we don't watch, we'll leave God out. If we don't watch, we'll, we'll become enamored with things. Lust of the flesh, desire to enjoy something. Lust of the eyes, desire to get something. And then there's a third stage. That's old age, the pride of life. The desire to be something. Let me tell you what I used to do when I was a boy. You little whippersnappers think you did something. We had to walk to school. Now they pay $48,000 for a school bus and then build a $280,000 gym just so you can get some exercise when you get there. Duh. Did I tell you about my grandson? And a friend said, no, we appreciate that so much. We really do. <clears throat> the pride of life. A desire, you know, resting on our laurels, our accomplishments. Let me tell you about some of the great revivals I've had down through the years. I have to watch that. I've moved into that stage where I would be tempted to, to depend on, glory in, count on my accomplishments. This is our 50th anniversary at the church this year. My son is planning a five-day celebration, and he said, Dad, I, I want to exalt you. I said, son, don't do that. Don't do that. We don't need that. And they'll have all this big show, 
And I'll be sitting there thinking, oh, Lord, they don't know me like I know me. I'm just a skunk. You just saved me by your grace. I didn't do anything anybody else couldn't have done. You know, we, we get to a certain age, we want a pride of life. So there's all kinds of cycles of life. I was talking to a woman on, a, on the airplane. I was going to witness to her. She was a Catholic lady and a very a lady with some substance to her and 50-ish. And um, so I was talking to her, and I said, well, tell me about your children. She told me all about her children. I said, well, what does your husband do? Oh, my husband divorced me. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, I'm so sorry. She said, yeah. She stared out. She was standing up. I'm sitting in the seat. She had finished her leg. She was a stewardess, and she would finished her leg of, of service, and she was staring out the little round window down below. She said, yeah. She said, uh, he went through the change of life, and he went crazy, took off with a, another woman. And then she said the funniest thing. She said, you know, it's funny. We women, we go through the change of life. We just dye our hair a different color or something. <laughs> but she said, these men go stone crazy. And she's right. You know, a man comes to the age that he, you know, it comes to the age and he still thinks of himself as young. And somebody even suggests He's getting older now. Maybe he can't do all he used to do. Oh, he panics. So he's got to prove to the world that he's still young and got it. So what does he do? First thing he does, try to get the attention of some younger woman. And there's always some ditzy young woman willing to receive the attention of a man about any age. Say amen, ladies. So what does he do? What does he do? He throws his marriage away, half his fortune away, his testimony away, his walk with God away. Because he's trying to prove to himself he's somebody that he's not. Know your cycle of life. Know your cycle of life. Um, there was a girl grew up in our church. That girl never put on anything that you wouldn't want one of your daughters to wear. Sweetest angel in the world grew up in our church. Went away to Bible college. Married Mr. Wonderful. Came back. Had a bunch of children. Came to my wife. She said, I am tempted to wear things I've never put on in my life. I'm tempted to go places I've never gone in my life. I'm tempted to say things I've never thought in my life. What is wrong with me? And my wife told her, said, honey, it's just your age. Women reach this cycle of life, this age, and, and when they do, they get squirrely ideas in their head. Another woman, I mean, she would have been voted woman of the church in, a, in our church, and she came to my wife and said, I'm driving my husband crazy. She was a farmer, just an old working farmer. She said, I'm driving my husband crazy. She said, what are you doing? She said, well, he comes in. I'm asking him 40 questions about who he's been with and, and who he's been talking to. And I get in my head, he's talking to some woman out there. My wife said, well, has he ever given you any reason to believe that he has another interest? No. My wife said to her, honey, it's just your age. You go through this stage of life, squirrely ideas. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. We all go through stages of life, and we need to talk to ourselves and stop and say, whoa, what, sta what age am I? What stage of life am I in? And talk to ourselves. Talk to yourself in the hour of the Drag up a chair. <laughs> hey, the other day, uh, well, not the other day, but not long ago, I went to the chiropractor. And so as I was walking out of his office, I said, Doc, let me ask you, my back hurts me sometimes. And I said, um, uh, what, uh, what word of wisdom do you have to tell me? He looked me square in the eye and said, the first thing is this, remember you are not 30 years old anymore. <laughs> I didn't like that. I didn't want to hear that. Matter of fact, that irked me, but I stopped and had a little talk to myself and says, okay, I can deny the fact or I can listen to what he says and control how much I lift and, and, and what all I do and going to have to have a talk with ourselves in the different stages of life, okay? Uh, talk to yourself in the hour of life's natural crisis. Talk to yourself in the hour of temptation. Nehemiah chapter 5. Me, I'm, I'm moving, you can tell I'm preaching 180 words a minute with Gus up to 210. So I'm doing the best I can. Now listen carefully. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 9 and 6. The Bible says, Nehemiah said, I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. Then I consulted with myself. I had to talk to myself. I was very angry. Is anybody in this room never gets very angry? If there's somebody in this room that never gets very angry, would you come up and sign my Bible after service? I've never met anybody like you in my life. 
and, and I worry about people that can't get angry about something. Say amen right there. Uh, very angry. And uh, he said, I was very angry. Well, what did he do? Hold it. Then I consulted with myself. Nehemiah says, I'm going to go out there and strangle every one of them. And Nehemiah said back to himself, you do and you're going to blow it. You're going to mess up everything you've ever tried to do. And you're going to bring disgrace on God and you're going to mess up God's plan. I don't care if I mess up everybody's plan. I'm going to kill them the way they... All right, go ahead and blow it. He had a talk with himself. Then he went out and rebuked the nobles and princes. He did what had to be done, but he did it right. He did it with the right spirit, and God blessed it. I don't have time to develop all that, but I'll tell you this right now. We need to have a talk with ourselves. Let me give this illustration. I have a friend. You would know his name, I bet. But don't ask me after service. I won't tell you. I wouldn't tell you who this is for the gold you could put on this platform. I had a preacher friend. He's still going. He's still in evangelism full time. I had a preacher friend, and I heard that a, a boy had violated his daughter. And when I heard that, I heard he was going to kill him, that he said he was going to kill him. Well, people blow a lot of smoke, but I knew my preacher friend. And if he said he was going to kill that boy, somebody better be getting to him because he was just probably going to do it. I didn't have time to get to him, so I called him. I was very close to him. I called him. And I said, hey, I said, uh, here, you got a problem? He said, yeah, but I won't after Saturday night. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to kill that boy. I said, you're not. He said, watch me. I knew he was going to do it. Now, this is a guy, been in the ministry 30 years. When, when you take somebody to walk with God that long, but when they break, it's Katie bar the door. And so I, I said, he said, would you give me one Bible reason why I should not kill that boy? I said, yeah. How about thou shalt not kill, one of the Ten Commandments? Is that okay? Could we start there? With, with, I mean, just for starters, you know. It was like pouring water on a duck's back. I wouldn't get to him. I knew it. I said, finally, I said this. I said, are you going to let that boy do you worse than he's already done? He said, would you tell me what's worse than he's already done to me? I said, sure, I'll tell you. You're going, to let, you're going to let him park you in prison for the rest of your life and take you away from a precious wife that has done nothing but be sweet and loyal to you and watch her waste away in sorrow for the rest of her life? Are you going to t- let that boy take you away from your other children who are doing well and hadn't done anything wrong and watch them go to hell with the rest of this scoundrel crowd because you let that boy park you in prison? Is that what you're going to let him do to you? He got quiet. He goes all over America telling everybody, Larry Brown saved my life did not save his life. All I did was got him to set his carcass down and talk to himself. You have to talk to yourself in the hour of temptation. Talk to yourself in the hour of temptation. Yeah. Um, you know, Terry Angel was my assistant pastor for 10 years. Terry Angel, every time you walk out of his office, he had a little patch on the door. And here's what he said. What I do today will affect Hannah and Ben tomorrow. Hannah and Ben was his two little children. Terry was a handsome fellow, always was, a very handsome guy. And like myself, he had a temper, and he was also subject to temptation of women, normally. And he'd read that little patch, what I do today will affect Hannah and Ben tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to face. Some low-down Wolf in sheep clothing, female may throw herself at me. I don't know what I'm going to face today. Well, however I handle it, it's going to affect my two little children tomorrow. And he, he was talking to himself every day when he walked out of that office. Terry's now in his 60s. He's been true to God. God's used him. He said no a thousand times to different types of temptations. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll give you, I, I'm not done, but I'll give you one more illustration and this is. I was teaching this in Maryland, and a lady came up to me after the night after I taught this. Watch it now, I'm done. Here's what she said. She said, I have been texting and communicating with a man I'm not married to. Watch it now. She said, I've been, I've been communicating with a married man, and I'm married. And she said, after you preached what you did last night, I went home and I set myself down and I said, are you crazy? You're going to throw your marriage away and throw 
tear up that man's good home and his wife's a good godly woman. You might as well take a knife and run in her back as to what you're doing to her. Are you nuts? What's wrong? You're going to sell your soul to, uh, down the road to destruction over uh, one hour of six sensual sin. She said, I went straight and texted him, called him. I'm not talking to you anymore. I don't want to be around you anymore. I don't want to have she saved her life, her marriage, and that man's life and her testimony for God because she drug up a chair and had a talk with herself in the hour of temptation. I was preaching this in a, in a very large church, uh, teaching it in a very large church, and after service, the pastor was showing us the beautiful buildings and grounds. A fellow shot up in a little, little truck, and uh, he was a bus captain, just let his kids out, uh, and he'd come back to the church. And he was as far from me as those boys are standing against the wall there. And uh, as he, I'm talking to the pastor, Rhonda was standing to my left. And as he pulled up, he was looking at me. And he, I, I'd never met him. He got out of the truck. He cut, here's what he did. Just like the, if I were where these boys are, here's what he did. Well, I thought he was going to hit me. You know, I, I thought, well, this is it. He's going to try to hit me. <laughs> he walked up, and here's what he did. He said, never know who you're preaching to, do you? And I said, sometimes you don't. He said, a 21-year-old man raped my 13-year-old daughter this week. In that truck, I've got what it takes to kill that man, and I have an appointment with him Monday morning. He didn't know it. I was going to kill him. And I looked at his right hand was trembling. He said, after you told that story you did this morning, talked about talking to yourself, he said, I'm not going to do it. And I had a little more, a few words with him, make sure we had him stop. You're going to have to talk to yourself. I have to talk to yourself in the hour of sin and defeat. The prodigal down by the hall pen. But when he came to who? Himself. I got to quit. Time's up. Lord, I pray you'll bless this lesson. Dear Lord, I pray that you'll take the part that I was able to teach and use it, dear God, for the honor and glory of God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, I don't know you folks, but I already like you. I really do. All right. Pastor, you're up.